name is Jared Taylor. I'm the editor of American Renaissance and president of New Century Foundation, which uh, sponsors this meeting and which also puts out American Renaissance. And the title of my talk is Prospects for the New Century. Now, obviously, it's pretty dicey business uh, talking about what's going to happen next week, uh, much less what's going to happen in the next 100 years. So uh, there is a certain built-in idiocy, in fact, in talking in terms of centuries. So I think I'll start by talking a little bit about the previous century and see if we can learn something from the previous century that we might apply to this one. And then what I'd like to talk about is the anti-national, anti-Western, anti-particularist ideology that now governs us and what our prospects are for overthrowing it. Now, as for the last century, let's be frank, it was a disaster. For those of us who love the European people and their heritage, the hundred years we've just gone through have been an absolute horror. How different the world was in the year 1900. That was a time when Europeans and their overseas brethren were really the only cultural, military, or economic force that mattered in the world. Whites were convinced not only of their fitness and of their rights, even their obligations, to defend their own homelands from cultural or other kinds of invasion, they considered themselves fit to govern the world. Now, needless to say, the hundred years after that were a remarkable decline, and you might touch on some of the highlights, one being, uh, well, two being fratricidal wars, terrible, terrible fratricidal wars that we fought. Communism was likewise a terrible self-inflicted wound. But the worst thing, I believe, that happened, and it happened later in the century, was a terrible loss of confidence that afflicted whites all around the world. World wars were terrible, but the West rebuilt, and communism was terrible too, but it was finally done to death. But a loss of confidence, a loss of confidence so profound that it begins to border on self-loathing, that is what makes the 20th century one of unprecedented losses. It makes it, I believe, perhaps one of the most dangerous and potentially fatal periods in our entire existence as a people. What we've lost is a firm sense of legitimate peoplehood. We've lost the ability to say us or we and to have it mean anything other than foolish late 20th century cliches. Most whites simply cannot bring themselves to say this is our culture, this is our people, this is our nation, it belongs to us and no one else. For the first time, in their existence as a people. For the first time in thousands of years, whites can actually contemplate their own dispossession without flaming up in immediate outrage. They can imagine themselves becoming a minority. They can imagine their traditions being ignored or scoffed at, their culture ignored or insulted. They can imagine all these things and then pretend that this will somehow be enrichment, be a benefit. This is, and I want to underline this, this is a staggering development. It's probably without precedent in the entire history of the world. When a people becomes cheerfully willing to become a minority, when it's willing to turn its cities over to the children of aliens, then it's a people that has reconciled itself to oblivion. It's a people that's preparing its own death as a nation. And this is the great potentially fatal blow that we suffered in the 20th century. As an example of what we'd lost, let me quote a certain Congressman Vail of Colorado. He was one of the supporters of the 1924 Immigration Act that was designed to keep the country white. And he explained his reasons for opposing non-European immigration in these words said, we need not be vain about our own qualifications. It well behooves us to be humble. What we do claim is that Northern Europeans, and particularly Anglo-Saxons, made this country. Oh, yes, the others helped. But that is the full statement of the case. They came to this country because it was already made as an Anglo-Saxon commonwealth. They added to it and they often enriched it, but they didn't make it, and they have not yet greatly changed it. We are determined that they shall not change it. It's a good country. It suits us. And 
no matter what their virtues, we are not going to turn it over to someone else, and if there is going to be any changing to be done, we'll do it ourselves. Now, I like that. If there's any changing to be done, <laughs> that was what Americans could say in 1924 and pass legislation by saying things of that kind. But this idea, if there's any changing to be done, we'll do it ourselves. That, of course, is what every healthy f people feels. That's the way Mexicans feel about Mexico, Japanese about Japan, Indians about India. Any healthy people wants to, to keep hold of its own destiny. Of course, in America, we are now commanded to believe that absolutely any change that comes from importing anyone from anywhere in the world will be a marvelous improvement. Any other race, culture, religion, language, you name it, is going to be superior to that of the founders simply because it's different from that of the founders. It makes no, pe it makes no difference if the people that we're importing have made a terrible mess of their own countries. Once they're here, somehow they will make ours better. <laughs> of course, uh, no white person really wants a non-European America deep in his bones. And that's, of course, why they refuse to live in those parts of the country that have turned non-white. And yet, we're supposed to believe that what we don't like in small doses, what we don't like when it happens to our own neighborhoods, is somehow when it happens to the This capitulation, it's this loss of will, this inability to defend themselves, that is the terrible disease of the mind it's a terrible disease that is more ruthless than war and more pitiless than pestilence. Let's think about this disease of the mind, if we may. In the United States, we have a constitution, and it forbids the establishment of religion. That doesn't change the fact that we actually have a state religion. <clears throat> you have to be an official member of the, of the religion in order, certainly, to uh, work for NBC, uh, hold political office, teach at Harvard, write for the New York Times. You have to be a publicly professing member of the church of egalitarianism and diversity. In order to hold any position of trust in this country, even to be a kindergarten teacher pr practically, you have to be a member of this cult of egalitarianism and diversity. Now, like all cults, this is one built not on any evidence at all. It's built on pure assertion. And the more obviously untrue and preposterous an assertion is, the more ardently we're expected to believe it. Proposition number one, and uh, some of the previous speakers have touched on this, is that all races are, of course, equal in every possible way. And we must ignore the history of Africa and Haiti. We must ignore the failure of every uplift program ever tried. We ignore the results of the Olympics. We ignore decades of psychometric testing. We must ignore all of this on pain of excommunication. Proposition number two, diversity is a strength. Now, having accepted this proposition, we have to ignore the fact that there's probably not one high school in the entire country where large numbers of people of different races gather together voluntarily. We also have to ignore the thousands of people and the, perhaps the billions of dollars who make it their work every day to manage this great strength known as diversity. All of the laws, all of the commissions, all of the outreach, all the sensitivity, all of this effort to make sure the strength doesn't somehow destroy us. <laughs> we also have to ignore, we have to ignore the fact that every serious bloodletting anywhere in the world is obviously the direct, direct consequence of diversity. But diversity isn't just our strength, it's our greatest strength. And as I said before, the more obviously stupid and untrue something is, the more enthusiastically we'd better believe it. That's the way. <clears throat> now, uh, that's the way cults always work, and woe unto the unbelievers. We have victims of excommunication and attempted excommunication right in this room. 
Whitcomb, Sam Francis, Michael Levin, Glade Whitney, Phil Rushton, Frank Ellis, who will be coming later on. I'm sure there are many more. We could go on and on listing the victims of excommunication. It happens all the time, and not just in America. It happens all the way around the world. I'll talk about them later, but uh, our outspoken baseball player, Mr. John Rocker, the Austrian politician, Jörg Haider, and, uh, of course, uh, Craig Nelson, the immigration activist in New York City. I think all of these are interesting cases that I'll talk about later on, but the point is they've been attacked in the most vicious and virulent ways because they have dissented from the cult. Indeed, the cult of egalitarianism and diversity is a worldwide cult, and all whites have to be members. Whether you're Swedish or South African, the high priests have their eye on you all the time. The cult, of course, and uh, Frank Ellis, who's speaking this evening, has uh, drawn some brilliant parallels here. It uh, very closely resembles communism in lots of ways. It is an all-consuming point of view, and it tolerates no argument. And like communism, because it is divorced from reality, it makes it impossible to follow a policy that makes any kind of sense. You can't build policy on fantasy. The communists thought that they could plan an entire complex economy, and the economy fell apart. The communists, they thought that they could get collective farmers to work harder than private farmers, and farming fell apart. We get the same kind of cult fantasy and cult failure here. The races are equal, of course. And so we integrate the schools. And what happens to the schools? Schools fall apart. The cult, interestingly enough, now drives our foreign policy, too, not just domestic policy. Do you remember why it was that we had to drop bombs on the Serbs? Now, William Clinton, he explained it in these words, and I quote, the principle we and our allies have been fighting for in the Balkans is the principle of multi-ethnic tolerant, inclusive democracy. Now, you see, the problem here was the Serbs had not yet learned that diversity is a strength. <laughs> they, were, they were being bad to the Kosovars. So we dropped bombs on the Serbs to teach them that diversity is a strength and to stop them being bad to the Kosovars. And now, lo and behold, much to Madeleine Albright's amazement, the Kosovars, they don't understand either that diversity is a strength. <laughs> Not even 6,000 tons of bombs and 50,000 soldiers from NATO have managed to convince anybody over there that diversity is a strength. They have this peculiar quaint notion that somehow language, religion, race, these affiliations are somehow more fulfilling than diversity. In a March 21 Reuters report, it says the occupiers, that is the NATO force, has finally given up Finally, a year later, get, trying to get the Serbs and the Kosovars to love each other. Now they'll be satisfied if the Serbs and the Kosovars can be made to stop killing each other. And this, uh, this dispatch quotes a Western diplomat as having said this. The whole international community was a little naive when it came here. <laughs> we were shocked that the idealistic approach didn't work. Shocked. Ladies and gentlemen, they were shocked. You see, when you're blinded by the cult, you're likely to be shocked very, very frequently. The cultists, of course, encouraged blacks to move into white neighborhoods, and they were shocked when the whites moved out. They insisted on integrating the schools, and they were shocked to discover that that racial gap in performance, in performance couldn't be made to change. They were shocked when Head Start didn't work. They were shocked by the Los Angeles riots. They were shocked by inter interracial violence. Of course, they would be shocked if they ever set foot in Haiti or Harlem, but those are places they never go, of course. <laughs> um, and they are probably more shocked than anything to discover that there are still a few retrograde white people who don't want to become a minority in their own country. <clears throat> Now, as I said before, when your view of the world is blinded by cult and ideology, there are just all kinds of things that go on in the world that are going to shock you and baffle you. And the pity is that these fools, I'm sorry, but they're fools, 
who were shocked by what happened and could not figure out what happened in Kosovo. They are our rulers. These are the people that tell us what they're going to do, and they are preparing future Kosovos just for us, right in our own country, by following this diversity immigration policy to which every other aspect of immigration has, of course, been sacrificed. Our diversity comes first. Immigration policy is, of course, making nations within nations that are inherently unstable, potentially hostile, and I don't doubt that they'll be shocked if things turn nasty. <laughs> now, it's just like the Soviet Union in the sense that policy is directed by fantasy and cult, and that's, of course, worse than no policy at all. And let me draw you another eerie parallel between communism and the cult of diversity and egalitarianism. And that is, nobody actually believes them. Now, in the early days, there might have been some true believers. I, I suspect maybe Lenin and Trotsky thought for at least 10 minutes that we were going to usher in the workers' paradise. They might have thought that. But for decades, communism staggered on despite the fact that no one believed, despite the old dissident joke, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. That system still kept going. We too, we too must have had our true believers, at least for a while. Let's think about Earl Warren. When he wrote that decision in Brown versus Board of Education 56 years ago, in his heart of hearts did he look forward happily and joyfully to the day when his great-grandchildren would be going hand-in-hand hand to school with little Negroes. Did he, in his bones, want that to happen? It'd be interesting to know. We probably never will know. And now, how about the current uh, great white father? He can't shut up about how wonderful diversity is. But does he believe in it himself? It doesn't look that way to me. Remember, his daughter, Chelsea, she went to school right over there in the District of Columbia Washington, D.C., and I bet with no trouble at all, she could have found classmates with purple hair. And I bet with no trouble at all, she could have had classmates who were going to have four illegitimate children by the time they were 20. I bet you also that she could have found classmates with AIDS, and I bet you that she could have, been to, she could have gone to school where she was the only person speaking English on the playground. In fact, uh, as John Rocker has discovered, these are precisely the kinds of people we're supposed to be dying to spend time with. And she could have found plenty of them, I suspect. She could, in fact, have had the most enriching diversity of experience at all, in my opinion, and that would have been to be the only white girl in her high school class. She had that opportunity. But no. Her daddy sends her off to private school for all these boring middle-class white people. Doesn't he care about her education, for goodness sake? <laughs> <clears throat> then, then there's that little matter of where the Clintons beside, decided to buy a new house, uh, at least uh, Hillary. Uh, uh, Chappaqua, Chappaqua, New York. It's about as lily-white a place as you're going to find this side of Iceland. <laughs> So it's no diversity for the Clintons where it really matters. No Mexican neighbors, no classmates who don't speak English. No, no, that's not what we want for little Chelsea, no. That kind of diversity is for the disgusting bigots who vote for David Duke, and serve the right, too. Yes, sir. So you see, that's the beauty of the cult. You don't actually have to believe. You don't have to really do anything in your own personal life that's egalitarian or diverse. You just have to say you believe. You just have to say you believe, and you support all kinds of regulations and rules and laws that will force diversity and egalitarianism on the poor slobs who don't have the money that you do so that they can escape from it. So here's yet another interesting parallel with communism. The old nomenclatura. These were the communist insiders who were paving the way to socialism. They were, of course, the only ones who could escape from socialism. They had their dodges and they had their hard currency and they had their trips around the world while the workers, the vanguard of the people, lived like serfs. Now, I don't think, certainly by the Brezhnev, you know, that they believe that Marxism stuff any more than Ted Kennedy wants half Haitian grandchildren. But they, too, they had a state religion, and they recognized that you had to be a professing member of the state religion in order to get your hands on the goodies and in order to be in the elite. 
And I think, like it or not, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way it is for most people. The state religion, it can be Marxism, it can be diversity, it can be Swedenborgianism for all they care. If that's what you've got to do to get your hands on the goodies, they pretend to say they believe just about anything. On the other hand, <clears throat> it certainly seems to me that if believers there are, the number is shrinking all the time. And let, let me give you just some things that make me feel that way. In the February issue of American Renaissance, we ran a review of the book Taboo that uh, Professor Rushton spoke about earlier. And uh, as you know, it's about the physical differences between the races, why the West Africans run faster, the East Africans uh, run faster too, and white people can't jump. Uh, the book says that blacks are biologically superior to whites, and that's why they do well in athletics. Now the author, John Enteen, he wrote us a little essay in which he described how awful a time he'd had finding a publisher. And what he said, of course, was that every last one of the editors who were horrified of the prospect of this book said, no, 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 you can't publish a book about that because the first thing people might think of as racial differences in intelligence. Even if you're telling people that blacks are better because they're superior, immediately they're going to think about racial difference in intelligence. That was what was on their minds. So here we have in the most timid, conformist, cowardly industry in the entire United States evidence of what I believe is really on their minds. I think they know the score. They're just pretending mighty hard, to believe, mighty hard that they don't believe. Then uh, there was Craig, Craig Nelson, the immigration activist in New York City. I'm sure many of you followed the saga of his anti-immigration posters that he put up in various places in the city. And uh, one, one I particularly liked, all it said was, tired of sitting in traffic? Every day, 6,000 immigrants arrive every day. A very simple message. And this guy, so far as I know, has absolutely no racial agenda whatsoever. There is nothing he's ever, ever said, nothing in his background that suggests this. What he did was live in China for a while. And he didn't like the overcrowding that he saw. And he didn't want the United States to become as crowded as China. It's as simple as that. A little bit more room for us and we'll be happier. But the cultists absolutely refused to believe. They, ref they insisted that he was racially motivated, absolutely insisted. Edward O'Donnell, he wrote this in the New York Daily News. He says, uh, Mr. Nelson's group, Project USA, cloaks its bigotry in allegedly high-minded concern over population growth, environmental damage, and urban sprawl. Cloaks its bigotry. Apparently, it's impossible to actually take those things seriously. And Melanie Carroll wrote in the same in the same paper, in the same vein, that Nelson is preaching, quote, thinly veiled bigotry. I'm sorry, thinly veiled hatred, no less. Of course, they're practically synonyms now. City council members, uh, they drew up these resolutions to condemn this guy. And all he ever said was he doesn't want the country to get overcrowded. And he doesn't think we ought to keep importing a million people every year if overcrowding is something worth thinking about. He's tired of sitting in traffic. But immediately, he's a racist. <laughs> now, once again, once again, this shows you what must be absolutely preying on the minds of the cultists. I think they didn't even hear what he was saying. Why? Because they are so obsessed with race and the prospect of racism. I think they suffer from a kind of hysteria about this that must be really enervating and exhausting. And I think that this kind of absolutely vicious hysteria with which people greeted a perfectly straightforward and legitimate proposal about population growth, the absolute craziness that, that greeted that is a sign of a certain desperation and hysteria in the cult. And then, of course, John Rocker. <clears throat> and as you all know, he gives us yet another parallel with communism. Rocker doesn't like to be around the kind of people nobody <laughs> wants to be around. Uh, perfectly sane, perfectly safe, uh, perfectly good thing. Well, not perfectly safe, entirely sensible thing to say, but what happens? As you all know, fine probation, blasted from one end of the country to the other. Now, and of course, he gets his head examined. So that's really the <laughs> pièce resistance. Uh, we have professional sports people who beat their wives, they commit murder, they have illegitimate children from coast to coast. What about this guy with purple and pink hair that wears women's dresses? No, that's all okay. It's the one sane man in sports that has to have his head examined. <laughs> <clears throat> now, 
Now, if good old John Rocker, if all he'd done is, I don't know, kill a few people, we probably wouldn't even know his name. So, here we are. We got communism all over again. It's like the old Soviet days. If you shook loose from the cult and you had some glimmering that maybe free markets were a little bit more efficient way to run a country, well, gosh, they thought you'd gone nuts. They put you in the nut house. <laughs> Today, in America, you shake loose from our particular cult and they try to do the same thing. They take your nuts. Now, on the other hand, don't forget what happened when John Rocker set foot back in the ball, in the first time in a ballpark after his fine and suspension. As you all probably know, he got a resounding, standing, uproarious ovation. The people in the stadium, I believe, they don't want America turning into a foreign country either. They know this diversity stuff is a pack of lies. In fact, when the newspaper in Birmingham, they had one of these readers' opinion solicitations, and they asked, should Mr. Rocker be punished or shouldn't he be punished? They got more responses on this than any question they have ever asked their readers. And how many people opposed punishment? 97 percent. 97. Now, this was supposed to be a controversial statement. I think a lot of ordinary Americans, they just don't buy this cult. So, what are our prospects of destroying the cult? <clears throat> the problem, and it's a big problem, e even though there aren't that many believers, and I think even though the high priests of the cult, like William Clinton, are obvious hypocrites, ordinary people just don't have much of a chance to express themselves. And I'm sorry to say, a lot of them are still very much afraid to say in public what they know to be true in private. We've got to get over that. It's in Europe, interestingly enough, that we see some encouraging signs of change. Many European countries have proportional representation in their legislative elections. And that's why the French National Front can get 15% of the, of, of the vote, put the fear of God in people. And even more spectacularly, the Austrian Freedom Party, and they get 27% of the vote, move into coalition government. That's very exciting, significant. Now, about this 27% who voted for the Freedom Party, do you think 27% of the newspapers in Austria supported Jörg Haider's part? Oh, I don't think so. Austria has the same state religion we do, you see. And in order to work for the press or uh, the Wiener Zeitung, you've, you've got to be a cultist. It's just like here in the United States. And so just as we had a stadium full of ordinary Americans whooping and hollering for John Rocker, 27% of the Austrians in the privacy of their ballot box said, the hell with this cult of diversity. We want Austria to stay Austrian. And of course, the culties are absolutely terrified because somebody has finally pointed out the emperor is running around in his underwear. Can't have that. <clears throat> so we have in Europe today, prime ministers and presidents in Europe saying that the fact that Jörg Haider's party, the Freedom Party, is in a coalition government is a threat to democracy. Well, have they gone goofy? When the number two party goes into coalition government, that is democracy. This just goes to show you the incredible hysteria that goes into practicing the cult. Now, of course, they're terrified that uh, they, might, they might end up with the same thing in their own countries, the Blams Blanc in Belgium, the National Front in France. Then, of course, there's the Swiss People's Party. The Swiss People's Party, they too, they glided into second place, and they're now in coalition. You know how? You know what they campaigned on? At least what was most widely represented. Their campaign poster showed brown-skinned hands tearing up a Swiss flag, and they campaigned against liberal immigration and asylum policies. Now, it, it makes me wonder, what kind of results would you get if you had a nationwide campaign on those themes in the United States? Really, what kind of results would you get? 15%, 20%, 30%? What about the white vote, for heaven's sake? Might you get 40%? I don't know. I think the sentiment is there. Unfortunately, we have this pathetic Tweedledum, Tweedledee system, and it's hard to break into the monopoly. But the sentiment against the cult, I believe, is strong and it's growing. Now, I wish I could tell you that we've got this thing licked. It's just a little longer, it's going to collapse. But no. I don't think so. The trouble is, we can have, as I think we clearly have, a very powerful state religion, even when nobody really, really believes. We saw that in the Soviet Union. So our system could run for a long time on pure hypocrisy. I think largely it already does. And so the country can very well sink deeper and deeper into third world squalor. 
more dissension of all kinds, and the cultists, of course, they will, they will move from their gated and guarded homes to their gated and guarded private schools, their gated and guarded country clubs, while the rest of the country changes in a way that shocks. It's not as though the writing isn't on the wall, after all. You can already sample third world squalor in just about every big city in the country. In fact, you can sample several flavors of third world squalor in most of our big cities. Los Angeles School District. What have we got? 70% of the students are Hispanic. 57% have what's called ling limited English, English proficiency. And what's the result? 50%, fully half of the students in the public schools in Los Angeles, that's the second largest in, our, in the country after New York City, can't make the grade to be promoted to the next grade. And believe me, those standards are not tough. One half of the students should not be promoted to the next grade. The writing is on the wall. And look at South Africa. That's another place where the cultists just get shocked time and again. Listen to what Mary McGrory wrote in her May 12, 1994 column in the Washington Post. And here I will quote to her, quote from her, uh, talking about how wonderful a black run South Africa was going to be. She says, it will be the first time a country has an official policy that is nothing less than applied Christianity. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela has won what the Washington Post calls one of history's sweet, sweetest victories over racial subjugation. And he's going to keep it clean and beautiful so that newspaper readers will think they are reading scripture when they read dispatches from South Africa that cannot be read except through tears. <laughs> no. Uh, words, words fail me. Words just fail me. What, what a, I, I hate to use such a strong word again, but I think it's a, what a fool. Africa is now run by blacks. It gets worse by the hour. Age is out of control. The parliament keeps passing these anti-white laws. Whites are clearing out if they can. The ones who can't uh, live behind fortresses. It's the rape, murder capital of the world. What was once, uh, as uh, Phil Rushton was suggesting, uh, an outpost of European civilization is slipping back into the jungle. But dispatches from the new South Africa are going to sound like scripture, and we will read them through tears of joy. I mean, th th this is stupidity that is so great, it, it borders on the perverse. And this is stupidity so breathtaking, so profound, so paralyzing, it can kill you, ladies and gentlemen. But this is the kind of stupidity, of course, that the cult requires, and that's why the cult has to be rooted out. Now, in the struggle against the cult, we do have a priceless advantage, and that is we're right. Science is on our side. History is on our side. The newspaper headlines are on our side. And increasingly, I believe, Americans are on our side. What about science? The Human Genome Project, I have every reason to believe, is going to prove definitively that what Thomas Jefferson suspected about the races 200 years ago and what Arthur Jensen boldly put back on the national agenda in 1969 is true. What about history? Peoplehood, peoplehood is really the strongest force, I believe, in all of history. After their families, peoplehood and nation is the one thing that large numbers of people are prepared to die for. It's common ancestry and common destiny that community and culture grow in. That's what takes root in the hearts of men. And history is nothing more than a story of national and tribal destinies. And history sure isn't over yet. What about the headlines? You can't pick up a headline, a newspaper, without reading yet another hand-wringing story about the latest minority uplift plan that flopped or how the Kosovars or the Tutsis or even the people of Chappaqua just won't embrace diversity. And then there are all those stories about the latest gene that's linked to this form of behavior, that form of behavior. And this all despite the fact that the newspapers are written and edited by the cultists, and yet there's a constant refrain that comes out of these stories. The cult is a lie, and the cult has failed. And how about the people? Well. The cult has, of course, had the, the bullhorn to its mouth for four straight decades, but people generally refuse to learn. They are capable of mouthing cult platitudes when they absolutely have to. But where do they live? Where do they send their children to school? Whom do they, whom do they marry? 
Who do they have over at dinner? They know what's right out of pure instinct. And this instinct has resisted all of this cult propaganda for decade after decade. And it is this instinct that we must awaken if we're ever to overthrow the cult. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a struggle that's going to come from the top. It's going to have to come from the bottom. The people at the top, they all sold out to the cult a long time ago. If they had not sold out to the cult, they couldn't be there. It's the real people in America who are going to have to fight this insanity and take the country back. It's the Council of Conservative Citizens. It's the grassroots movements led by Barbara Coe, Glenn Spencer, Louis Calabro against immigration. It's all of these movements springing up on the country. It's the people who cheered for John Rocker. It's the brave professors, some of them in this room, who, t who demonstrate that you can speak the truth even in the strongholds of the cult. It's the dissident columnists like Sam Francis, Joe Sobran. It's all the people, like, and people like them in Europe, Canada, Australia, who love their culture, who are proud of their people, who want to grasp their destiny. They're the ones who are going to have to make the next century a whole lot better than the last one. Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, we've got about 20 minutes. We can take some questions here if anyone. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, could, maybe we can wait till the boom comes your way and we can get your comments. Or you go to the boom. Is that uh, too much to ask? Perhaps someone in the back could ask a question and then Professor Hart later. Uh, is that a possibility? Any questions? Well, no questions. Professor Hart, looks like you're on board. Uh, speak, loudly. speak loudly. Yes. yes um, quite not facing them. <laughs> quite all right. The turning point, the disaster of European civilization occurred apparently at the First World War, when unfortunately all these white European leaders uh, brought their collective countries into this absolutely suicidal, ridiculous war, and maybe that's the point at which they lost some confidence. Does it in any way shake your confidence into what white Europeans do before they're overwhelmed by this cultist ideology? Uh, well, good question. In other words, you're asking me, uh, given what whites have done over the last hundred years, what's the hope that they'll do anything differently? Uh, maybe it's a kind of an irrational hope, but I don't believe that millions and millions of white people are just going to march off the stage of history. I just don't believe it's going to happen. And even if that is what ends up happening, some of us have got to be talking. Some of us have got to be working. I think that we have a chance. We have a good chance. And if we give up now, then we might as well all go sun ourselves and never come to an American Renaissance conference. I agree that there are many things that appear to be going wrong for us. And at the same time, though, I see the United States, and look at Europe, too. We have these two contradictory movements. At the elite level, you have people blaring one more cult stupidity after the other. You think they have gotten absolutely as preposterous as can be, and they come up with something new. This uh, thought police in, a, in some British town where they're going to send people into restaurants, plainclothes policemen into restaurants, and see if they, they might overhear a racist, com a racist conversation. This, this, this is just cuckoo. I think that at the same time, and I cited some of the evidence earlier, I think at the same time in their, real, in their lives, real people are moving in the other direction. They're fed up with this. For example, on the whole question of media coverage for a conference like this, I've never believed that we should wait until we get good media coverage on something like this. We get media coverage because there are millions of people out there who can read between the lines. They hear what we're saying, and they want to hear what we're saying. And I think if enough do, enough minds are changed, this country can be one that our ancestors would be proud of, after all. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Graham. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everybody, since it's been getting so much publicity, that Thursday is National Tartan Day. And it's not Black History Day, it's our day, so perhaps we can dress to reassert our identity. Recently I was in Michigan, and one of the men there said that our men have been disarmed between the ears. And until they're ready to fight, however we define that, 
nothing is going to change. And Jared, I'd like you to comment on whether you think our men have been disarmed between the ears, and if so, what we can do to turn that around. I think they've been disarmed uh, between quite a few other places, too, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> uh, well, yes. Uh, Sometimes I think it's, uh, it's astonishing to see the pusillanimous way in which white people behave and imagine that just a few decades ago these very people, or certainly their ancestors, were landing on the beaches at Guadalcanal or taking Iwo Jima. Im almost impossible to believe that this is the same species. Yes, uh, we've been denatured. We've been denatured. But uh, uh, if I didn't think that we can be renatured, if I didn't think that there was some kind of rejuvenation still left in our millions of white people, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. Um, any more? Uh, I'd like to uh, keep more to questions, if you please. I know people have lots to say, but uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma uh, Ms. Coombs, yes. Yes. I would just like to uh, say that in regards to the cult, um, I don't believe that it is um, an actual belief system so much as um, psychological warfare directed against the population, um, not only to demoralize it and immobilize it, but also to, as a, um, to actually flood various countries with different kinds of people. <clears throat> because the global power elite wants a global subject. It wants a globalized population. Massive immigration is serving that function. It's, it's breaking down nation states and ethnic groups into more manageable units. Uh, they previously attacked religion and the family. They're continuing to do that. It's a multi-pronged assault, but it's, it's primarily psychological warfare directed against uh, people as opposed to you know, a, a belief system. Well, uh, I think if what you describe is true, and uh, many people would agree with what you said, that there is a kind of collective meeting of the minds about what has to be done, and they're busy doing it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that uh, I, I believe that. Uh, I'm not convinced that there is really a large number of people who think, OK, we're going to do this because it makes these people weaker. I, I just don't think there's that much malevolence out there. Many of you will no doubt think that I'm a, an inexcusable wet for saying this. But uh, I think one of, the, one of the great advantages of the cult is that you can get a guy like William Clinton, an obvious hypocrite, who gets patted on the back, he gets fawned over for saying certain things, saying things he doesn't even believe. But I think that it's not because he's so much malevolent, but that's where, that's where the interest system is all built. That's where the reward system is. I, perhaps I'm just uh, hopelessly naive, but I, I just don't think there are large, large numbers of our fellow men who are thinking, rubbing their hands at night, saying, OK, what nation are we going to destroy next? You know, what, what peoplehood are we going to smother now? Uh, <laughs> well, maybe even a small number. I, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced of that. Um, so, once again, perhaps I'm wrong, but I think uh, perhaps I have an advantage over some of you in that once upon a time I was a liberal, maybe hard to believe, and uh, uh, I'm related to a lot of liberals, and uh, I've spent a lot of time talking to the liberals, and I think that most of them, most of them, they really do think they're doing the angels' work. They're wrong and they're stupid, but I just don't think they're as malevolent as perhaps uh, many in this room would suspect. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know, in addition to the approach we're kind of taking here, which is kind of the genetic approach or different, you know, aspects of differences in groups and, and races, uh, do you think we should also start to really assault on the fact that these are basically, you know, the whole ideal of coming to America that even liberals promote is that it's self-governing and we have freedom of speech. But yet what they're basically telling us is because we have so many people who are not now native European Americans, that it's impolite to criticize them. So we have to give up our right to self-government in terms of immigration and racial differences. We have to give that away. I thought that was the whole reason these people were coming here in the first place, is to have <laughs> self-government freedom of speech. Well, uh, I think you are absolutely right that as more and more disparate peoples come here and their inherent hostilities flare up and boil over, you have to have a government that's essentially a fire department. It's putting out fires all the time. And in order to put out those fires, it has to extend its reach further and further into every corner of our lives. 
I think an excellent example of this is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If we had been a homogeneous uh, European country, there's absolutely no reason for the government to deprive Americans of what had been taken to be an absolutely fundamental right of the Englishman, a right to free association. This is something that we have said goodbye to for one reason only, and that's diversity. Diversity took this right away from us, or at least it was the pretext for taking it. What's going to happen next with gun control? Look at those charts about crime. For heaven's sake, we don't really have a gun problem in this country. I hate to put it in such blunt terms, we have a minority problem in this country. And that's why there is something to the idea that, oh, look at the guns. Well, I would say to you, look at the people holding the guns, for heaven's sake. And that is, of course, what the cult refuses to do, egalitarianism. They are absolutely equal. The data, the data that shows differences, well, if you can't explain away the data, you just ignore the data. And so, yes, I agree 100% that all the rights of self-government that we used to have, I think they will be chipped away because it takes this overarching nanny state in order to keep diversity from, as I said before, destroying us all by itself. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. On the other hand, if the Libertarian Party were to turn around its position on immigration, it takes many other positions which would strengthen the majority of Americans. The opposition to gun control, the opposition to welfare, the drastic reduction in taxes so that white people would be able to have more babies. That sort of thing. Do you see the Libertarian Party as a positive factor if it were to turn around on immigration? Well, uh, the latest issue of American Renaissance has an article that has uh, produced quite a controversy among the readership. Uh, it argues that this kind of, this cult is not inherent to liberalism. It argues that up until a few decades ago, just as politics used to end at the water's edge, politics ended at the race's edge that you could be a socialist, uh, you could be anything at all, a communist, and still think that America should be a white European country, that there's no contradiction in, in those things. Um, I think that that's not inconceivable. I, I think that uh, we have to have a coalition that gathers as many sources as possible to work together for this common ideal. Um, and uh, I'm afraid I'm rambling a bit because I lost the thread of your, con your question. Uh, could you repeat it once more? Uh, With the Libertarian Party. Yes, the Libertarian Party, the yes. Yes. If, yes, if the Libertarians, if the Libertarians could convince us all to be Libertarian within the tribe, if you will, I think it might be an excellent vehicle for some kind of uh, rejuvenation. But just like the environmentalists, I think the Libertarians, they are so blinded by the cult too that they are incapable of seeing, of making this step. They can't make that step and realize that there's something that we have to say is ours and no one else's. Remember when the Sierra Club took that vote against immigration. There was this tremendous battle inside. Now, if you're a true environmentalist in the nature's wonderful sense of the word, how can you possibly encourage the importation of more people? How can you possibly do that? And yet, with a straight face, they would say, well, in effect, we must do this. We must do this. And uh, I think, I think there's, there's potential there. As I say, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today if there weren't potential there. Many of those people in the Sierra Club, they of course knew it was a hotly fought contest. And I think as time goes on, as uh, it, you have to stand in line to wait to get into Grand Canyon, uh, you have to make reservations six months in advance for a camping place uh, in uh, Yosemite, a few more light bulbs are going to go on, even if there's not an explicitly racial consciousness there. I think the reality will change some people's minds. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Can you expand uh, somewhat on, on some of the reasons why you think such a, uh, an extensive demoralization has occurred, and, and, and also how much the, of a fact that the, the Holocaust is in, in the present situation? Well, that's, of course, uh, the $64 question. What, what has caused this psychological capitulation? 
Uh, I've thought about this for a long time, and I know of many theories about it. Uh, some people think that Christianity is a big part of the problem, that Christianity is a universal religion. It's not exclusively for certain people. That's part of the problem. I think it's undoubtedly the case that the bloodshed of two world wars, and after all, in the First World War, uh, England lost seven million men, seven million men. And for six, we lost 600,000 men in the war between the states, and we think that was a staggering loss. This was, this is enough, that was enough of a jolt to, I think, uh, any reflective people. And I think whites are, in fact, one of the things that distinguishes them is how reflective they are. Any people that inflicts that kind of devastation on itself, not just once, but twice, I think that had uh, a real jarring effect on the self-confidence of the white man. Uh, then, of course, uh, there are some people in this room who would argue that Jews have been a decisive, even a decisive or important factor in uh, trying to denature the racial or national consciousness of people. I think it's without a doubt that uh, there is, uh, in the, you, will find, you will find more Jews, certainly more Jewish public intellectuals on the opposite side of this issue than on our side. But I don't think that that means that all, uh, it obviously doesn't mean that all Jews are on the opposite side. We have some very vociferous, articulate people on our side too. Moreover, I think if you look at a country, well, Denmark, Sweden, well, what sort of Jewish control is there in these places? And they are just as cult-ridden as we are. Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's not, it's not, none of these things that I've mentioned I find particularly satisfying. I think that if we fail, if we fail, and 500 years from now, when the Chinese issue their great Chinese encyclopedia of the history of the world, they are going to be utterly flummoxed to come up with an explanation of what did the white man in. I mean, he, he had a pretty good innings there for a while. And all of a sudden, poof, gone, gone. Just walked off the stage of history. Uh, I, uh, as I say, there are partisans of all of these different points of view. And uh, I think uh, I have tried to get to the bottom of this. Obviously, you want to get to the bottom of the problem in order to solve the problem. But none of these individually, and not even collectively, frankly, is satisfactory to me. Never, ever has a people welcomed a dispossession. It's just against human nature. It's against all of history. And to bring something as radically, radically sick as that about, perhaps it's something in our genes, for heaven's sake. I would hate to think that, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I've made some arguments along those lines in the past. Uh, I, I don't have a satisfactory answer, and uh, I don't discourage discussion of that point, but I, as, as I say, in my own experience, I, I'm just not satisfied with uh, what I've come up with. Uh, just brought up about in 500 years the Chinese encyclopedia. I think them looking back, how did this happen? I think people that are proponents of diversity, for instance, Jesse Jackson, whenever he talks about minority rights, he always brings up women. Brings so up a, what? He always brings up women. Oh, we must fight for minority rights and women. So it's always dividing and conquer, conquering. White men are against white women. Mm. I think the key is really to. to you know, increase membership of white women and get them to understand what's going on. Certainly, certainly. If they, if, if they only knew that the lies they're being told, they're just, they're not being awakened to it. How is New Renaissance gonna try to help to recruit women and then bring, this, bring them to this thinking? I think that's the key. Look at this. As far as how do you bring more women in? Well, I think you have the same problem. How do you bring more men, men in? You can look around here, it's almost exclusively a male audience. But I think that we're, we're really the same battle. Women, women will come to a movement like this when it has men who are middle class, hardworking, attractive, when it, when it ceases to have a kind of aroma of the subterranean about it. I think that's something that terrifies women far more than it does men. On the, in every political movement, if you have a movement that does have that aroma to it, you'll inevitably find that it's full of men and very few women. But what we have to do is become less aromatic in that sense. Become, we have to be above ground. We have to be confident. We have to be entirely straightforward about what, about what we do. I think that's essential. And that's why I think something like what Frank Ellis is doing, making an absolutely exhausting, hectic 12-hour trip in the United States. He's going to spend 12 hours in this country just so he can absolutely jab a finger in his administration's eye 
That is the kind of thing we have to support. Too often, too often. When one of our people comes under attack, the rest of us sort of oh, down in the foxholes, you know, watch out, incoming, oh, you don't want to get hit either. We've got to stop that. Our ancestors wouldn't have done that. Not in a million, well, I was going to say not in a million years. Well, you start counting the years and uh, they do begin to do that. Uh, I'm afraid, well, let's see, uh, a few more questions, if you please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. In the. Huh? Oh, well, oh, you're deciding for us, right? Well. Yes, ladies first. Ladies first. T take the mic. Take the mic. There's time enough for both. Oh, I see. She has to be in there. Okay. I guess as one of the few women that I do observe here, I would like to say something is that my husband and I had a little talk about that when we noticed very few female faces about why there weren't more women here. And I said that I think that it's because of that very cult thing that you're talking about, because of the very idea of how much speech is suppressed in this country, that all these people here are soldiers on the front line of a battleground. And I think That's that right. when people are, are more will people are willing to join um, this issue and more people are willing to speak the truth and to listen to the truth, you'll find more women because y you don't normally find women on the front line of a battleground. Although, of course, Bill Clinton thinks we should just, you know, normally give aid and comfort to the enemy yes. by just giving them our women, you know. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. they don't have to burn our cities and conquer us to get our women. We just give them our women, you know. We put them on the front line of the battle. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think that's, that's part of what I was describing earlier, the, the evolution of the different sexes' mentalities. Uh, men, it was useful to have a pugilistic streak to them. You had to put your dukes up or your women got wiped out. Women were far less exposed to that kind of controversy. And I believe whenever you have soldiers on the front line, if you've got women there, they're only there because they've been dragged there for the most part. So your point is absolutely correct. We have to cease to be the front lines. We have to cease to be the front lines. And in that, we have to become more open, more institutionalized. I hate to use the word more respectable. But then women will certainly come. I, th I think it's an inevitable thing. Yes, sir. A cult of diversity, the, the golden calf seems to be the Wall Street economy. And do you believe that the Wall Street economy has to crash or uh, burst for us to uh, reassert our, uh, our white racial identity and to uh, stop this 